is the recording on yes sir yes. okay just now put on okay so what i'm trying to tell you is that that uh, this uh, syllabus is very simple and uh, i'm telling this to you in the first class that when you as a fourth year you come in don't take this don't be complacent on therapeutics therapeutics is such a heavy topic so you should be doing other things also okay and you should never forget what is studied in therapeutics 1 therapeutics 2 because therapeutics 3 is very simple see when we say peptic ulcers we may get some peptic ulcer diseases peptic ulcer admissions but admissions also will be less and admissions will not be over a long period of time gastroesophageal reflux disease gerd what we call it that may also be there admissions may not be for so much and then inflammatory bowel disease admissions may be there and uh, not very heavy disease liver disorders definitely alcoholic liver disease constantly patients will be there viral hepatitis with uh, gastroenterologists will be managing all those things and uh, will come to drug induced disease so in patients you may not get more but opd patients you may get more okay when you go to hematological systems anemia to everywhere you get anemia anemia is uncountable innumerable but but do you get them admitted is a question mark <clears throat> venous thromboembolism it will be there that is also less and uh, blood drug induced disorders okay epilepsy we have a good department and the neurology department is there now so you may have <coughs> epilepsy parkinsonism may be less <coughs> alzheimer disease may be there especially with uh, with uh, the uh, elder care department stroke lot of stroke patients come there thromboembolism lot of patients come there generally one week one patient or two three patients may be there psychiatry we have a good psychiatry department there will be patients will be there but may not be admitted okay so your role is to be more proactive though patients may not be admitted but you need to be working seeing those things then uh, pain management this is theoretical learning but at the same time you need to see how, what are the process steps they use in various pain management acute pain chronic pain neurologic pain headaches and things like that what do they do so you must see in almost both surgical and uh, medical they have various strategy for pain management you need to look into all those things then there is evidence based medicine this is an amazing topic and uh, you need to really because now what you are doing is unless and until there is an evidence you just don't accept anything and you talk to doctors based on evidences okay so evidence based medicine is very important and you must really learn that particular aspects very seriously if at all you have a long term career it is in evidence based medicine you need to be in position to say so and so paper says this so and so research says this so and so says this so and so mechanism says this so and so that is why so and so that is evidence so evidence is medication depending upon the evidence that are before you very cc for that is something called as systemic review okay other day i sent in a group about one conference that is going to webinar is going to be held uh, in uh, naipur uh, northeast gohati naipur i think on systemic reviews so you must learn in systemic reviews what is systemic review systemic review is say for example now viral or peptic ulcer the thousands and thousands of publications in peptic ulcers will be screened and they understand what are the various things people are talking about and what the literature says literature what says is yesterdays what what research papers review papers says is todays and looked into all these things they say this is what they say but this is how it is that is why this is how it is and to the consultant you need to say sir you treating it like this but the evidences treatment evidences say so and so and that is why this and this has to be done and that will give them a lot of confidence you want to suggest a change to them you must always suggest them 
with the evidences that is before you and give them a publication, give them a paper that justifies the evidences so that he will be in position to accept your suggestions. They always say, what is the backing? What is the logic for what you're suggesting? So you should be in position to say, this is what it says. That's why I say item number six, evidence-based medicine, you all guys have to really expertise yourself. Apart from six, I don't see any challenges in any of the other topics, but they're important. You need to learn that, okay? And I also say that you are coming for three times, you'll be going to hospital for three times. Lot of things to be seen. This is the, let me tell you one more thing. See, now you are coming to fourth year and uh, you should be now getting yourself to be pruned yourself as a, as a consulting clinical pharmacist. No longer as a routine. See, remember, unlike B farm, unlike M farm, unlike D farm, here you are not just learning, but you are a practitioner where what you learn, you make things happen. You'll be talking to people. When you want to talk to people, you have content within yourself. Okay, so you have to be more proactive in learning and then communicating, develop friendship with the clinician, developing friendship with the, we have a lot of DNB students in the hospital, friendship with them and doing some projects outside, maybe in the hospital, maybe outside, maybe community activities, something where you will implement what you have learned. Okay, some community, you remember we did something like a, the, what is that? The prescription audit and things like that. Home medication to review. Where you have a people to talk to them. This is what the literature says. This is what it is. This is what the care to be taken. This is why it has to be taken. This is how it happens, okay? That is the way. See, all I say is that you have to mature yourself now to be practitioner than a mere learner, okay? Let me say practitioner what do you mean by practitioner you have to be an authorized you have to develop your authority over the subject okay and even at home to your people at home to your relatives you should say this is how it is this is how it is this is why it happens and uh, you should talk more like you know uh, you should be more competent like a md physician md md medicine person okay you are not identified person, you, you don't talk about your qualification, but you talk about your knowledge. The knowledge is very important. That's why I, as I started with PT3, I'm giving you this hints that you will never be people who say I have studied. No, 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 no. I know you've studied, but I have gained this knowledge is very important. And I can be put to challenge anytime. I can be now I can be put on the spot anytime. And remember, if you are that, your consultant clinicians will highly respect you. I'll give you one. You see, I've been teacher here for quite some time. Your teacher, Naresh, he was my student for a long time. And he's, 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 his uh, skill or passion for developing knowledge Developing interaction with the front teacher, with the clinicians and the senior people, junior people in the college hospital has made him to be a favorite among the senior professors, senior consultants. So I know that sometimes they call him, even his odd hours. Can I give this drug? Give me some suggestion. Can I change this drug? I was wondering why they have to call Naresh. But he has definitely develop that relationship. So it is a relationship that comes in as you demonstrate your knowledge that you have. Okay, I want you to learn this. I'm just trying, taking time to tell this so that I'm taking time to tell this so that you tune yourself correctly for the days to come. Okay, I don't want you to be just looking at sessional marks, final year marks, this, all those things, see, marks will keep chasing behind you. But what is important is how you shape yourself up for the future from today. Remember, many people say, farm D, the job, this, uh, this, and I say, are you competent to be, to stand on yourself and declare that I can handle things? 
as a family person then you ask people will come running behind you see i naresh is one of the best example of student he is he's got a, many even international professors have appreciated him and they want to hire him see because he has developed the culture of being more proactive okay so <clears throat> let me say this before i start a short training teaching now now let me tell you what will i be doing one two i'll be basically covering one two and five okay one two and five i'll be covering and uh, if possible six but three four six balkesh will be covering is that clear i'm not hearing from anybody yes sir okay. yes sir yes sir so, so i will try to come back for six otherwise balkesh sir will do three and four okay you tell sir also we had a class where sir uh, will be doing one and two and uh, five and uh, sir will be doing three four six maybe six i can also do no problem but let's see how depend upon how much of a load sir has clear okay with this now let me start my talk you see my slide you see you see my ppt yes sir okay this is very important peptic ulcer disease okay lot of people are complaining on peptic ulcer now i'll be doing it like this let me just briefly tell you an introduction in the first hour first uh, few slides what is peptic ulcer and then what are the challenges of peptic ulcer why and then we'll get into little bit of his anatomical aspect which organ that affects and then we'll get into pathophysiology how peptic ulcer happens what are the causes for this disease and then we will see if at all little bit of epidemiology where how much this disease happens and then we will jump into the management what is the first stage of management first stage of management is a patient comes to you you need to ask him so first stage is muh se baat karna hai talk to him by mouth by mouth what is happening so and listen carefully so that is a history taking so is a medical history so you need to listen from him to say what is happening and that will give you an understanding are this happened to him okay and then person has to be examined so there is a clinical examination is important so you need to know about clinical examination so you when you look at a patient you should say ah right this exact clinical examination is very important so do a clinical examination and then clinical examination will give a particular understanding then you need to get into the uh, laboratory examinations so one is clinical examination then investigations investigations can be lab investigation that is there's all blood parameters or it can be radiological investigations x ray c c t mri blah 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 or it can be the any other related investigations okay so what i'm trying to say is investigations it may be sometimes you have to take the tissue do a histopathology that what we call it as a biopsy can be taken in the histological thing so there has to be a synchrony between investigations and clinical examination and history so one two three are here three are here that is investigation with history clinical examination these two has to sync then investigation has to sync once these three three syncs then you say wow i think you have this that is called as the differential diagnosis so you have a differential diagnosis you further rule out rule out rule out and go into some more investigation some more examination to arrive at a final diagnosis okay and then once the diagnosis is clear then this the st next step is get into treatment 
that can be it is either pharmacological treatment or it can be non pharmacological treatment for example it is see if it is peptic ulcer you have already studied in the in the pharmacology various classes of drugs that need to be given for peptic ulcer that becomes a pharmacological teaching treatment and then you need to say do this do that do this do that this kind of a stuff to take care of your stomach don't eat this do eat this drink this and all those kind of a stuff is a non pharmacological teaching non pharmacological therapy okay so as a result the disease it becomes peptic ulcer disease the person is eradicated from peptic ulcer disease okay so i'm just telling you how i generally look at a subject and in these things when it comes to therapy you need to know the doses you need to know various uh, formulations various uh, drug 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 interactions various drug dose uh, what are the, 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 the side effects adverse drug reactions you need to know various other challenges associated with the drug that is given okay so that you need to understand very clearly and uh, why do you choose this drug why not this drug why can it be given as a combinations all those things has to be you should be competent enough to check remember one more thing i started by saying as a as a what is that the c you say a plus b is or a 1 plus 2 is 3 but it is not always this formula works in the treatment see it's all clinical specifics the patient conditions vary continuously so you need to know what is a patient condition and then accordingly what treatment has to be given is that clear so this is a pakka road map that will be clearly worked out and uh, then at the end of the day you see the patient is out of it that's exactly what a clinician does so now in the in the in, the, in, in this class in this uh, fourth year you need to partner with the clinician for example if one of you are willing to go sit with dominic sir that would be great watch him how he treats us how he diagnoses a patient how he gives a medication and how we see is the progress see now doctor we know this there in the hdu watch how he is doing this patients what is the progress he is seeing see uh, you can see even icu hicu and many other wards you we are social with the friends we are with the doctors you be friends of those people and tell let them tell you how they watch how they do that okay so then you will beautifully learn the skill of this though you are not doing the uh, in your profession you are not doing the diagnosis and treatment but that is a part of your life okay okay having told you that <clears throat> let me just move to the brief on peptic ulcer so when i say peptic ulcers so peptic ulcer is a disease is a disease that involve both stomach or duodenum which comes first stomach comes first or duodenum comes first stomach 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 correct okay stomach and then goes down to duodenum so gastric ulcers can be to both duodenal ulcers or stomach ulcers gastric ulcers or duodenal ulcers that usually cannot be differentiated based on the history alone but although some finding may be aggress suggestive but you need some more investigations so epigastric pain is the most common symptom for both gastric and duodenal ulcers these are generally characterized by gnawing or burning sensation you know sometimes when you eat some food later on you see burning sensation and that can occur generally after meals or classically shortly after meals with gastric ulcers and if it is duodenal ulcers then it occurs 2 to 3 hours after the after taking food then you know see that is why when you taking history we ask them when do you get that burning sensation oh immediately after food sir then you say ah that means the stomach is a culprit no sir 2 to 3 hours only i get this then say okay it has gone down to the duodenum now an uncomplicated peptic ulcers the clinical findings are few and non specific because they are generally simple see for this 
the alarm features that warrant prompt gastroenterology referral includes bleeding when why bleeding bleeding because the intestine has perforations why perforations we'll come to that later on the ulcers have the ulcers have damaged the tissue over there and has led to bleeding the blood vessels are ruptured bleeding and as a result of bleeding there may be anemia and then early satiety that means you eat just one half a chapati or little bit of food you feel full that means stomach does not have space to take more food then there will be unexplained weight loss you really do not know unexplained weight loss is actually a condition for many many cases not just this progressive dysphagia then recurrent omitting family history of gi it can even lead to cancer gi cancer so patients with perforated peptic ulcer disease you when usually present with a sudden onset of severe sharp abdominal pain okay so these things very clearly indicate what may be the condition the patient is having okay then um, but in most patients with uncomplicated peptic ulcers routine laboratory tests are generally not helpful instead the documentation of the peptic ulcer disease depends upon the <coughs> radiology radiographic or endoscopic confirmations what do you mean by endoscopic confirmations anybody knows what do you mean by endoscopic confirmations inside the camera will insert hmm tell me both of it tell we will insert one uh, pipe uh, mm. uh, with a camera with a camera in it and we will record the inside okay. parts correct in other terms it is sending the camera inside okay sending the camera is a lot of types of endoscopies are available these days which will clearly see what exactly is happening what is the extent of damage what how severe is the damage so okay that is a radiographic confirmations you see the endoscopic confirmations and then you will i'll discuss with you later on this organism called as h pylori is one of the very very dangerous organism h pylori <coughs> h pylori is essential is an infection that is h pylori infection is essential in all the patients with peptic ulcers this h pylori is a organism that causes the ulceration so there are certain tests are there rapid urea tests are considered to be considered the endoscopic uh, endoscopic diagnostic test of choice that means you just do that then you know that h uh, pylori is there so this is an organism can be killed by the microorganism antibiotic <coughs> there are other non invasive tests are there apart from h pylori uh, apart from uh, this uh, uh, the uh, this called as uh, fecal antigen testing which is more accurate than antibody more than antibody testing is less expensive than you breath urea breath test but uh, so that is one test this is called as a fecal antigen testing then fasting serum gastrin level this should be obtained in certain cases to screen for zollinger ellison syndrome we'll briefly discuss this zollinger ellison syndrome is we'll discuss about it as we are discussing the other the gi disorders so upper gi endoscopy is preferred in the diagnostic test in the in in the evaluation of the patients with suspected peptic ulcer disease and the endoscopy provides an opportunity to visualize the ulcer to determine the presence its presence the degree of the active bleeding the size of the size of the perforation and uh, uh, to, and also it we may start hemostasis but direct measure sometimes there are ways of putting sutures and blocking it or giving some drugs to close it so you know where exactly is a hole and uh, some of the per endoscopy or uh, is performed in early patients older than 45 50 years and in patients associated with the so called alarm feature so if at all doctor is not clear what exactly is happening he says wait let me see by camera inside seeing is better than just presuming it 
So most of the patients with peptic ulcers are treated successfully with the, the cure of H. pylori infection. That means the antibiotic. When you know H. pylori, so we say that it is a is a is a peptic ulcer. There's a standard regime is a later on we will see. This is antibiotic is regularly given to kill the H. pylori organism or avoidance of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. Tell me which is non, give me an example of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. Aspirin. Aspirin, one more. Diclofenac. Huh? Acetaminophen. Acetaminophen, then? Diclofenac. Diclofenac, then? Mucilite. Crocina. Huh? Crocina. Ibuprofen. Ibuprofen, you say. Crocilite. Yes, very good. Very good. Now, what will these, paras these uh, aspirin like drug do in the stomach? Can it be answer me? What will this aspirin like drug do to the stomach? See, you think wild is an open question. Okay. See, always when we think and imagine, then if it is the answer is nearby, closer to that, it will stick in our mind. What will this aspirin like drug do to the stomach? Increase production of gastric acid. How? How? That is why I said evidence-based medicine. How, where, what, why are important questions, important words. Okay, let me tell you. <clears throat> Acetyl salicylic acid, that is the aspirin, is an acidic molecule. And this acidic molecule, when it goes into the empty stomach, it gets adhered to the wall of the stomach. Clear? When you are taking some water and some kind of a powder in that, even soluble powder, don't you see it being adhering to the wall of the glass? Isn't it? So, like that, when it is taken on an empty stomach, it gets adhered to the wall of the stomach and then this is an acidic molecule. So, this acidic moiety or acidic molecule, it it just irritates that. So it just scratches like this, okay? If anything is scratching there, you feel it and slowly, if the scratch increases, then the wound happens there, isn't it? So exactly that's what these molecules do. They remain to get stuck to the wall of the intestine and they start itching over there or scratching over there. When they start scratching or irritating that particular place because it is an acidic molecule, it is uh, stuck over there and then it will cause some kind of an irritation. That irritation will feel you like you know, acidic, will feel you irritated. And then it will increase the acid secretion from the see, increase of uh, the histamine is released. The histamine is a histamine is is from histamine is released from the mast cells. Histamine is a secretor of the, the acid. So acid is secreted over there and that will cause further aggravation. So it, is, it was now only this. Now along with this, one more friend has come in called as histamine. That, that, that will again release acid. That acid will continue to start corrode over there, increase acidity, increase corrosion. And so as the days go by, it is not overnight. As the days go on, two months, three months, one year, the wound increases and becomes perforation. And then the blood vessel around that area gets ruptured. Then it becomes bleeding. How do you see bleeding? In the stool, there will be bloody stools. Or there, some person may even omit blood. So you see the bleeding. So slow, somewhere when you send the camera inside, small holes you see, big holes you see or small wound you see. That is how it is. So the ulcer will not happen overnight. It is over a long period of time. Later on, we'll see some etiological factors why this happens. So <clears throat> NSAIDs 
and not just in SCIDs. There are many, 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 many different drugs are there. Remember, drugs are the main causes for these kind of a pathological conditions. And along with the appropriate use of, see, that is why anti, these anti-inflammatory drugs and many other drugs. <clears throat> so, the recommended therapy for primary, recommended primary therapy for H. pylori infection is not just the anti PPI, what is PPI? Proton pump inhibitor. Proton pump inhibitor is basically anti-secretory drug. That means they will inhibit the release of acid molecules. That's why it's called as proton pump inhibitor and triple therapy. Triple therapy means there is an antibiotic also in that. Okay. So as this strategy will help to decrease a very high percentage of ulcer conditions. So you have to heal the ulcer, you have to coat that, you have to kill the organism, you have to facilitate the curing. Various strategy has to be adapted. So in patients with NSAID associated peptic ulcers, one of the most important thing is you need to know which is a challenging drug. If it is a drug that is causing, stop it immediately. And then continue NSAID, then continue PPIs, and then other medications, if at all the H. pylori is there, continue that and aim towards the eradication of the H. pylori. Okay, so prophylactic regimes have been shown to dramatically reduce the risk of NSAID induced gastric and duodenal ulcers, including the use of prostaglandin analogs or PPI. That is why now you go to a doctor, any prescription you will have. Pantoprazole, yes or no? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Pantoprazole, umiprazole, umiprazole is not there, no? Pantoprazole. Ranitidine was so much there. Nowadays, ranitidine is stopped. Pantoprazole, pantadac, pantoprazole. What does pantoprazole do? There's only give it as a prophylactic. Make sure that if at all this causes irritation, then that uh, release of acid is decreased. So, in addition to that, they also give H2 blockers. What is the role of H2 blocker? Tell me. What is H2 blocker? Histamine release. Huh? What is the difference? Maybe it's a release of histamine. Okay, what is the difference between H1 and H2? What is the difference between H1 and H2? Chapu, tell me, what is the difference between H1 and H2? Forgotten that? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, how many receptors are there for histamine? Histamine, H1 and H2. H1 is basically all this <clears throat> antihistaminics antihistamine receptor in that in the smooth muscle and uh, uh, mucosal membrane smooth muscle all those h1 receptors h1 receptors this uh, uh, they will cause contraction of the muscle or they will cause uh, they will uh, the blood vessels contract blood vessels and also H1. This is all these antihistaminics are H1s. Okay. <clears throat> then H2. This H2 receptor is there in the stomach. Okay. Basically there it acts on the release of the histamine. Okay. H1 and H2 blockers. Tomorrow as you have to study a little more about where our H1 is there, where our H2 are there. So H2 blockers are the histaminic receptor blockers in the stomach. The H2 are there in the stomach. And when this histamine is blocked, so I told you when the irritation happens like this, histamine is released. Histamine causes hydrogen. So you, uh, you immediately block the histamine release by means of H2 blockers. And then PPIs, proton pump inhibitors. Proton pump, in, there is a proton pump is there to which H is released. So you block the proton pump. So as a result, even though irritation is happening by means of drug or anything, 
the the release of um, acid will not happen there okay so that is how it is called as the maintenance therapy or prophylactic therapy by means of h2 and h2 blocker and ppi okay now <clears throat> there may be sometimes need for and uh, recurrent uh, need for surgical interventions all depends upon the severity and sometimes patients with gastric ulcers are also at the risk of developing gastric malignancy see that is why one thing is called as stitch in time saves life if you have a disease handle it immediately otherwise it will get lead to all kind of a complications okay so <clears throat> now let us quickly look at the anatomy of the stomach or and so which are the organs that responsible for the uh, the uh, the ulceration okay and which are the part of the stomach part of the body responsible so many because many surgical procedures for uh, hepatic ulcers disease entrail some they also try for some vagotomy vagotomy a discussion concerning vagal innervation so the abdominal visceral is in a way appropriate so we need to know what are the nerval innervations are there to the stomach there is a left anterior right posterior branches of the vagus nerve descending along either side of the distal esophagus they enter into the thoracic cavity they can communicate with each other through several cross branches that comprise the esophageal plexus and uh, below this plexus there are two vagal trunks again they become separate and distinct before the anterior trunk branches to form a hepatic pyloric and anterior gastric branches okay so the posterior trunk branch to form posterior gastric branch and is also called as a celiac branch see now you see here this is the stomach okay right esophageal nerve left esophageal nerve and these esophageal nerve supplies to this so it is basically one way you can do is you can cause vega vagotomy that means block the vagus nerve and reduce the uh, incident reduce and we make it as one of the treatments but actually that is not a permanent treatment but this is one of the anatomical features for the uh, peptic ulcers the parietal cell mass of the stomach so uh, is segmentally innervated by the terminal branches from each of the anterior posterior gras uh, the gastric branches so these terminal branches are divided during the highly selective vagotomy the gall bladders is innervated from afferent branches of the hepatic divisions of the anterior trunk and consequently the transection of the anterior vagus trunk performed during the trunkal vagotomy if at all that is necessary can result in a dilated gall bladder with inhibited contractility and subsequent so but see it's very important whether these things are really required but vagus nerve controls the nervous innervations of the stomach is very important <clears throat> okay now let's look at the pathophysiology so peptic ulcers are defect of the gastric or duodenal mucosa that extend through the muscularis mucosa okay you all know that i've been talking about it as i started this so the epithelial cells of the stomach and the duodenum secretes mucus mucus in response to the irritation of the epithelial lining and as a result of cholinergic stimulation i told you when this comes and foreign body comes and irritates like this then there is a secretion of some other substances mucus secretion happens or as as the acid secretion happens whereas hormonal secretion happens and also if there is a cholinergic stimulation cholinergic stimulation can be due to emotional issues due to many other external issues due to cholinergic stimulation is vagus nerve we are talking about is a cholinergic gland cholinergic innervation vagus stimulation can happen as a result there is more of acid secretion so the superficial portions of the gastric and duodenal mucosa exist 
in the form of a gel layer okay which is impermeable to the acid and pepsin okay so the body is so beautifully created to make sure that though there is an acid the stomach acid is ph is how much what is the stomach ph what is the stomach ph 1 to 2 1 to 2 okay it's a highly acidic isn't it though it is so highly acidic the stomach is safe so there is the there is a kind of a coating is there mucus mucus mucosa in the form of a gel layer which is impermeable to acid and pepsin though acid and pepsin are there it will not get into the tissue because tissue is to be protected so that is how beautifully the the creation is okay mucous membrane and the stomach is taken care of the tissues are taken care of and other gastric and duodenal cells secrete bicarbonate which aid in buffering acid that lies near the mucous membrane so the ph is so beautifully managed you need higher ph okay but remember there is a coating from the ph and from the tissue there is a muc duodenal mucosa is there which will not allow that to be penetrated down to the tissue then there are prostaglandins prostaglandin of e type have an important protective role because pge increases the production of both bicarbonate and the mucus layer how beautiful no so prostaglandin e will make sure that if a tall acid is increasing it will immediately increase the thick mucosal membrane and it will increase the bicarbonate bicarbonate will neutralize the acid and it will say the tissue over there in the stomach is so delicate so dear to me i will not allow this acid to go and touch the tissue there okay so that is the mechanism inside that is it you and i have not made the creator has created you in that form that even though you do indulge into something the there are barricades are there to make sure your stomach is not affected okay so now in the event of acid and pepsin entering the epithelial cells so <clears throat> generally protection is the bilayer trilayer two or three or four mechanisms of protection is there but transfer traveling through the protection if there is a if the pepsin and acid enters the epithelial cells then there will be injury tissue injury so within the epithelial cells the ion pumps in the basolateral cell membership membrane and help to regulate the intracellular ph by removing the excess hydrogen ions what i'm trying to say is that even if all in spite of all these things the tissue goes inside the acid goes inside injury goes inside and then now the tissue is getting hurt how it will get increase more acid coming out then again there is a mechanism to ensure that the excess of acid will not be released now reduce the number of acid so that the stomach or the epithelial protection is very important but in though through all through the process of restitution healthy cells migrate to the site of injury and make sure that injury is negated that is the way how body is generally created mucosal blood flow removes the acid diffuses through the injured mucosa and provides bicarbonate to the surface epithelial cells so it is nobody tells it and uh, if the acid is coming more on epithelial cells the blood flow removes the acid it means it just washes the acid out of that place and coats it with the bicarbonate so that their surface epithelial cells are healthy not affected okay so under the normal condition the physiological balance exists between the gastric secretion and duodenal mucosa defense there's a beautiful duodenal mucosa defense mechanism existed over there 
and gastric secretion is always kept under control but it comes here but is very important mucosal injury in spite of all these things you allow mucosal injury mucosal injury, thus peptic ulcer occurs the balance between the aggressive factors and the defensive mechanism is disrupted in other terms i'm working hard protecting the stomach but you are working hard destroying the stomach so i give up you go and kill the stomach this is exactly what i am trying to say here aggressive factors like non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs they will sit over there go on scratching 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 then the other things are the defense mechanisms they say no no you do whatever it is i'll do more scratching i'll take regularly anti inflammatory drugs regularly i'll take for one month or one year they will the defense mechanism gives up or when the defense mechanism gives up once that happens that pylori organism will come in they will sit over there start eating up the tissues there then people tell don't take alcohol you go on taking alcohol that to on an empty stomach and this alcohol on empty stomach will cause irritation inside and then the bile salts acid pepsin after all after the mu and alter the mucosal defense by allowing back the diffusion of hydrogen ions and subsequent epithelial cell injury you understand what i'm trying to say you should know peptic ulcer is not optional that means there is definitely a mechanism but it is it is selected by the person who is undergoing that he is some many of the people uh, cross the line and allow disease to happen the defensive mechanisms include tight intracellular junctions mucus bicarbonate mucosal blood flow cell restitutions and epithelial renewal all these are there if the epithelial cell is injured immediately new cells will develop new tissue will develop and it will come back but you say the more renewal is happening the more i'll kill it then that will say i can't do anything if you are inter if you are doing these things i can't do anything to help you that is the way the pathology comes in i hope you are understanding what i'm trying to communicate okay so <clears throat> then in addition to this there is a gram negative organism called as h pylori this is spirochete h pylori this was first understood way back in 1985 and uh, since then there are lots of studies are done on h pylori that reveals that it is a major part of the tyroid and includes acid pepsin it contributes to the primary peptic ulcer disease that means this is an organism that goes sits over there and starts hurting the stomach hurting the tissue okay there are unique this organism has unique microbiological characteristics such as urease production and allows it to alkalize its micro environment and survive for years in hostile acidic environment of the stomach so this is a danger organism and it knows how to comfortably stay there it causes mucosal inflammation in some individuals and even worsens the severity of the peptic ulcer disease so when h pylori colonizes the gastric mucosa inflammation uses usually results see first h pylori colonizes mucosa it starts hurting it then cause inflammation inflammation burst and then injury happens over there so there's a casual association between h pylori gastritis and duodenal ulceration and it is now established that it is a very very common both in the adult and also in the pediatrics now in patients with high h pylori high levels of gastrin and pepsinogens reduced levels of stomatidine have been measured that means the balance changes and in infected patients the exposure of the duodenum to acid is increased as a result there will be more of injury so virulence factors produced by h pylori increases urease catalase and uh, vacuolating cytotoxin then lipopolysaccharides all this will further aggravate the disease conditions okay so um 
most patients with duodenal ulcers have impaired duodenal and bicarbonate secretion, which is also proved to be because of H. pylori, because it because the eradication reverses this defect. So definitely it impairs the duodenal bicarbonate secretion. The duodenal bicarbonate secretion is basically there to ensure the uh, the uh, the H ions uh, toxicity is decreased. The combination of increased gastric acid secretion and reduced duodenal bicarbonate secretion lowers the pH in the duodenum, which promotes the development of gastric metaphrase. Okay, so <clears throat> the H. pylori infection in areas of gastric metaplasis induces duodenitis and enhances the susceptibility to the acid injury. Okay, so it is an external factor that facilitates the acid injury, thereby predisposing to duodenal ulcers. Now, duodenal colonization by H. pylori was found to be a highly significant predictor of subsequent development of duodenal ulcers. Okay. So, uh, now I have to, I'll just discuss etiology and I think I will uh, close with etiology. I'll, because I think my slides may get over soon. So I'll just discuss etiology and close with that. Etiology, peptic ulcer disease may be due to any of the following. As I've been telling you, number one, H. pylori infection. Number two, drugs. Number three, lifestyle. Number four, severe psychological stress, hypersecretory states, and genetic factors, okay? Now, these five, we'll go into a little more detail in the next class, okay? I will fix book a next class and I will go a little more detail into this in the next class. Now it is 10.30, no? Sir. So, yes, so okay. I will close this. I have some other commitment now, 9.30, 10.30, I took this class. And so I'll come back to you again. In the next class, I will discuss with you each the, the reason for H. pylori infection, reason the drug, how does a drug do, lifestyle, what are the lifestyle in, in, involved, psychological stress, very important, most of them must have experienced this, and there are various hypersecretory states are there, genetic conditions are there, okay? Okay, good. And uh, who will take the attendance for the day? You take, sir. Okay, you take the attendance and send me the attendance. Okay, and uh, I will again book a next class, maybe on Thursday, I will come in for one more, one more class and uh, we'll continue this. Is that okay? Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Did you understand what I try to communicate? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Tell me, are you vulnerable for practical, sir? Yes or no? I'm not. You are not? Some extent. Huh? Let's see, tell me, what is that? To some extent, because of lifestyle factors might be. Ja, okay. In the next class, we'll get into each of you, what kind of a lifestyle factors are making you vulnerable. Okay. <laughs> okay. We'll get into that discussion next class. Okay. Okay. Bye. We'll see you on Thursday. Thank you, sir. 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 Okay, bye.